Many organizations are looking to software-defined networking, or SDN, for their data center network. Now, there are two different leaders in this space, and they both have their champions in every enterprise. What's best for your situation? Cisco's ACI, or maybe VMware's NSX, or perhaps some combination of the two, assuming that's even possible. Well, I recently had a chance to dig into this topic with a couple of data center experts, because you've got questions, and today we are going to get some answers. So welcome to Tech 37, your podcast for technology, education, and collaboration from our friends at Worldwide Technology. Today's episode is sponsored by Cisco. Well, two technical solutions architects from Worldwide Technology join us to weigh in on these questions and draw upon their experience. Please welcome Matt and Eric. Guys, I'll have you introduce Matt. Let's have you uh, start. Tell us a little bit about what you do and uh, and what brings you today on our guest panel. Yeah, Matt Hilliker. I'm a technical solutions architect with Worldwide, like you said. I'm on our global engineering team at WWT, and I focus on data center networking. So anything software-defined networking as it pertains to the data center, ACI, NSX, and also traditional networking, things like that. Excellent, excellent. Eric, how about you? Eric Fairfield. Uh, part of our global engineering team, peer of Matt's, uh, focusing on all things data center networking, as he said, uh, everything from your classical design to software defined with all things ACI and NSX or both. Well, I wanted, those are two big subjects, um, but that's just probably just touching the surface in terms of what you guys have experienced in terms of all kinds of things that would come up in the data center. Uh, you guys are both global. You're both, as I understand it, assisting customers around the world uh, for worldwide technology. Uh, in various situations. So I'm not going to force either one of you to pick a side as it would be more fun from a challenging perspective. But uh, Eric, I'll just start with you since you were speaking last. Um, let me ask you, let's start with a setup. Tell us, uh, what it, how would you describe to someone that may not be completely familiar, what is Cisco's ACI? Key points. Cisco's uh, ACI, the primary uh, factors of ACI is it's a simple automated fabric to start with. That's one of the premise uh, points of ACI. Again, is the simple networking. It's a foundation that you can automate. And then on top of that, we get into the security aspect of ACI. We're able to secure the applications and end within the data center much more effectively in the past with both macro and micro segmentation. Is it fair to also characterized, just as we, we look to draw upon some just fundamental differences, is that ACI is, is a combination of both uh, overlay and underlay, perhaps more tightly integrated, um, or, or certainly designed to be tightly integrated, I should say that. Uh, is that a fair statement? Absolutely. I, I look at ACI as kind of a hybrid software-defined okay. network, right, where it owns the underlay, the traditional network underneath it, and the overlay and also extends into the cloud and remote sites as, as well. All right. We'll dig into those details more in just a moment. So let's go over to you, Matt, for NSX. How do you describe it to someone that may not be completely familiar with it? Yeah, so NSX is VMware's software-defined networking solution. A little bit different from ACI in that there isn't really any hardware component that you purchase from VMware as part of the solution. It all runs on either the vSphere or KVM hypervisor. So NSX does aim to be hypervisor uh, uh, agnostic, if you will, uh, supported on both vSphere and KVM. But uh, they sort of take a, a different approach, but ultimately still trying to bring networking and security policy to your workloads, your applications, wherever they may live. Well, just to get this done right off the top, can I get either one of you to just go ahead and give me the answer on which one I should deploy? Nothing. Wow, that's a loaded. That's a no. loaded question. Yeah. No, I know there's no there's no right answer. It's nothing better than asking an engineer to to make a uh, this is always the right answer kind of decision. Um, well, no. So how do we begin breaking these down? So I think they're both very worthy providers in the software defined space. They both have a lot of champions and people that are familiar with them. Uh, but what are the kind of things, how do, how do we, how do you begin breaking this down? Cause I assume you've worked with a lot of customers in these deployments. You've deployed both. 
So what kind of things are important to understand, perhaps use cases or something, in terms of uh, how people would look at these things differently? I would say, you know, the, the first thing that I look at is why are we having the discussion? What's what's driving the change in your data center network? Is it simply a refresh? Is there something about how you want to deliver your applications differently, right? Stepping back and ultimately looking at what's keeping you up at night? How can we resolve that? And where do you want to be in the next three to five years in terms of delivering your applications to the business? Um, well, let me ask, are there specific things that a customer watching this, let's just say it that way, if a customer is considering these things, what are the big elements maybe that someone uh, would be telling you in your consultative capacity that says, oh, that begins to tell me these are the things that where you start to orient in one direction versus another, what are the, what are the ones that tend to sway you? How about you, Eric? I would say uh, the things that tend to, to sway me is where, what are we looking for in terms of environments, right? Are we uh, looking at containers, cloud, multiple okay. data centers, right? Our, our amount of physical workload versus virtualized workload. Th okay. Those are the things that, uh, we, we want to start looking at is what what's that workload going to look like and where's it going to be and what's the connectivity requirements for it, you know, from a DR pers perspective, active standby versus active active, et cetera. Hmm. Matt, what about, what do you think? I would honestly completely agree with Eric. I mean, it's really, it goes back to being use case dependent and similar to what Eric said, I like to take a step back and really try to understand what are the initiatives of the business? What are the technical initiatives as well? And then where can a solution meet those initiatives in the middle? And so when you start to do that, you, you tend to tease out a few more details from the customer as to what they're ultimately trying to accomplish. It may uncover a, a much larger opportunity than just software-defined networking. It could be a, a much larger data center play overall. Uh, but you tend to really get to the root of what kind of requirements do they have of their data center from a networking and uh, security standpoint. Is it possible to get you guys to weigh in on what you think is better about certain solutions? And you can caveat it however you want. But I'm just kind of curious. I mean, obviously, I think everybody's going to be good at some things. And it's not to say someone else is bad at it. But what kind of things would you hold up as one being ideal for? Yeah, so I mean, I think it's fair to say, you know, that for a long time, a lot of people have considered Cisco as like the king of networking. Certainly there's other vendors out there, but a lot of us, you know, in the networking space at Worldwide, especially, have, we've built our career on Cisco. And so I think one area where Eric and I definitely agree that ACI as a solution is very good at is providing a very easy to provision underlay and overlay architecture. Okay. But then what ACA is also very good at is the multi-location capabilities. And this is all encompassed under Cisco's ACI Anywhere uh, marketing term, if you will. So you have capabilities like multi-site, multi-pod. You have cloud extension with the, the cloud APIC and uh, things like this. So Cisco has done a, a very good job in that area, I would say. And is that an important element that a lot of people, when they're moving to SDN, either they've already been doing something different in a more traditional fashion for multiple data centers and for security and things like this? You know, when they're going to SDN, what do you think is the big driver? Why now? What would be a catalyst uh, that may also help kind of open up the discussion? Yeah, I think, you know, IT teams are constantly being asked to do more with less. Um Network architectures aren't becoming simplified. They're becoming more complex, even if some of that complexity is being abstracted away. But the size of the teams seem to be shrinking over time. So yeah. the needs of the business are increasing, but the sizes of the teams are going down. And so there's this, been this push to try to abstract away some of these more manual tasks and uh, things like this, you know, tasks that don't really add a lot of value to the underlying you know, business, right? It doesn't really do anything for your apps and services. And so if we can abstract that away through some type of software-defined networking solution, 
then the engineers, architects, et cetera, they can spend their time uh, on tasks that actually do have a, a qualitative and quantitative impact on the, the business. That's always the dream. As busy as we are, all are, it, it's amazing how often the discussion comes up around, you know, moving towards automation and we're worried about not having a job. And I'm like, who's been getting off early each day um, and somehow finishing their to-do list? Because I have yet to ever encounter that. Um, I want to make sure, I want to I want to hear some more positives from a, from a VMware um, NSX direction. Eric, what, what would you hold up as saying these are the things you love about uh, what uh, NSX is capable of doing? Well, uh, you know, as, as Matt said, you know, one of the big things, Cisco's been doing this a long time, so NSX is having to, to, to catch up. But one of the things that I'll say is they've been catching up really fast. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, yeah. they've been uh, changing things, adding new features uh, very consistently. Heck, they even uh, completely changed architectures from NSX V, which only worked on vSphere, right, to NSX T, which has multi-hypervisor support. Um it, it's got bare metal support, it's got container support, right? Uh, and cloud extension, much like ACI does. And in fact, with NSX3, uh, Federation support came. So they're starting to get into the multi data center support game uh, much more effectively than, than in the past. So really they've been stepping up their game just as much as Cisco has. And uh, as, as Matt said, you know, it, it's, there's a lot of things that they both do really well. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a matter of step, stepping back and looking at what are we trying to accomplish? What one's going to check the most boxes? And are there going to be more boxes checked if we do both? Okay. Yeah, I want to ask you about both in just a second. But as a setup into that, let me ask you, just stick with you for a second, Eric, on uh, layer eight. Um, so I feel like there's a lot of times... There's a network team that probably has a lot of experience with Cisco and an understanding of exactly where things begin and end, perhaps even if they're not that familiar with ACI yet uh, in this scenario. Uh, but then there, the exact same thing could be said about your VMware fans that may be in a different part of the organization. And so I can imagine you guys have to reorient your conversation depending on who actually starts talking to you first in terms of what angle they may be coming from. But could you highlight a little bit about the reality of of how organizations are kind of structured and how that has an effect on, because we've seen this in other technologies, but how is it having an effect on these type of decisions? Oh, it, it, absolutely. It, it's crucial to get both groups in the room okay. together, working together. Uh, this reminds me of the old days in you know, the early 2000s when I started doing vo voice over IP, right? Uh -huh. Same problem. Yeah. Um, having to get both the server and virtualization teams in the same room as the network people, as the security folks. And again, getting back, getting away from, you, you'll see a lot of times where the network team brings Cisco because that's what they know the sure. VMware team and, and the OEMs target as such, where again, it's getting them in the room and saying, Let's talk about what the end game is, not about what this one does, that one does. What's the end game okay. and figure out the best option. Yeah. Does that often require, you know, because as I think back to even working in security and then you brought up voice and I've seen it happen in storage as well, where sometimes you're like, wait, it, it this can't be something that's going to be accomplished at a at the um, maybe the hands-on level, you need senior management support saying this is what we need to do, and 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 they're the ones saying these people have to be present um, in the room. When it comes to that, so let's talk about both now. So go back over to you, Matt. Um, is it possible to do both? It is absolutely possible to do both. Whether it's a good or idea or not again, is entirely dependent on what you're trying to accomplish, like Eric was alluding to there. Well, let's get into more details on that. Does it differentiate between, um, I don't think we've talked a lot about security differences, perhaps, micro-segmentation, um, and kind of where these things happen. What what type of differences are important from that perspective? Because I imagine you get all the same people in the room and you talk about being able to understand the long-term goals so that you can provide accurate device of how to get from where you are now to where you want to be. 
because it requires input and buy-in from both. But um, uh, our, uh, I guess from the security difference, it kind of going back to the earlier question of which, not which one's better, but what kind of things uh, become important in terms of how these are implemented. If you're looking at doing both, are you hobbling one versus the other or blinding one on the other when you're looking at those type of implementations? You absolutely could if you're not careful. So that's why we, we definitely encourage our teams to have a discussion with us and their customer when they start asking about bringing ACI and NSX together. They can absolutely work well together, but you ultimately need to understand like what are you trying to accomplish and then with what solution does it make sense to have that particular uh, task or, or um you know, the, the piece that you're looking for. So like you mentioned security, for example, does it make sense for you to build the majority of your security constructs in ACI with its capabilities? Or does it maybe make more sense to spend more time on that aspect in NSX? It ultimately just depends on what you're trying to accomplish. Going back to what you were asking Eric about earlier with, you know, what is NSX good at, you know, one particular area that they're uh, very well known for is this distributed firewall feature that has drawn a lot of customers to NSX uh, over the years. So it talk, could talk, very Can you well talk be. more about that exactly and define firewall just to make sure that we're all speaking from the same hymn book. What is, what is your definition of firewall in this situation and how is it, what is it that they're doing um, that's not easy to do or possible to do elsewhere? Yeah. So in the context of this discussion, when I say firewall, I'm really talking about a staple service, if you will, that can potentially look all the way up into uh, the layer seven part of uh, an IP packet, right? So okay. um, that is something that you cannot do with ACI natively. You can do something like service insertion where you can intelligently redirect traffic to a firewall of some kind, uh, with, regardless of what the vendor of that firewall is. But uh, the neat thing with the distributed firewall, which is a a truly distributed service within NSXT from VMware is that firewall lives at the workload level oh, wow. on every single NSX host. And so that's really, really cool because you're able to enforce security policy on a per workload basis. In fact, that you're enforcing that security before that packet even hits the virtual switch. And so if you talk about having a a segmentation strategy or some kind of segmentation initiative with a customer that tends to raise a lot of eyebrows because being able to segment east west is tends to be very important to them yeah and one of the things i'll add to that too is you know it when you compare that function to aci a lot of customers look for having a solution that looks from a rule set perspective like a firewall yeah and that's a big difference between ACI is it doesn't have that firewall rule set look that a lot of security teams do look for. So it, that's why a lot of people tend to gravitate towards the distributed firewall is that capability as well. It's, it, it, it's to them, it's a more natural approach and, and look and feel. Well, I feel like ACI has got a Granted, I, I'm not aware of its ability, and it makes sense that it wouldn't have the ability without a service insertion to be able to even see things at that level. And so I'm always a big fan of, of keeping security both close to the workload or close to the user or both um, in those situations and having some defined boundaries. But what is so? Could, but what is ACI doing from this perspective? Because from a security perspective, one of the things I've always liked is the notion of, of being able to, you know, uh, contract-based policy um, mm -hmm. Yeah, grouping things together to be able to simplify policy. Is that stuff go out the door if you're doing more security oriented stuff on the, on the VMware side, or does it still have a play? No, it, it, it still has a play. It, it really comes down to how we're trying to do and what the service that you're trying to, to deploy, right? If people are re requiring stateful firewall inspection, ACI in itself, the fabric is a stateless firewall that's based upon five tuple type value um, for the contracts, right? Okay. So it's it's really good at doing that. You just have to know how to build out your contracts and have that application dependency mapping if you want to get that uh, that much detail to your application security, right? Um, and again, that's a great 
I, I don't necessarily call that micro segmentation, but it's a great macro segmentation start. Not to mention it it has the macro segmentation capabilities of of multi tenancy and uh, multiple VRFs, and that is something that just started with NSX in 3.0, right? Okay. So the, uh, NSX just recently caught up to that, whereas ACI has had that since 1.0. Yeah. So that's something that could really work well together too because if you're bringing both aci and nsx together you know we like to think of security as like an onion you wouldn't want to just have a firewall out at the perimeter of your network and that's all you have because then if, if that device goes down or something like that and that's all your security well uh, you're going to be fairly well exposed there and so what you could do like eric was saying is use the contracts within aci to have a little bit more macro approach you know, kind of pick off the uh, the low hanging fruit, if you will, from a threat standpoint, and then get into more of your uh, micro segmentation type stuff down at the NSX layer, if you'd like. If I'm thinking of kind of the, and I'm just saying this loosely, but whatever you'd call the team that's probably more in favor of VMware, what, do you, what would you refer to people from that side of things? Are the virtualization team? Um, people that are more familiar? Virtualization compute team. Okay. Virtualization compute side versus network in terms of layer eight issues that we kind of talked about earlier, is it a plus or a minus? It sounds, cause it sounds like if you were doing both together, is there a layer three kind of boundary here that now keeps <laughs> those divisions completely separated so that you always know this is your set of stuff to worry about. This is my set of stuff to worry about. And do, do you see customers, if that's indeed the case, are customers jumping on this to preserve the easier path of not solving any organizational issues with a deployment and simply kind of preserving status quo by doing both? Is that a reason that anyone would ever do that? I, I've seen both approaches in, in how that's dealt with and operated where um, there might be a, a an ownership line in the sand, let's say, where the compute and virtualization team own NSX from a deploying the segments and all that. And the network team owns the BGP peering on the NSX edge and the rest of the network, the underlay, et cetera. And again, they hand off the, the compute team where they're, they're going to run with everything. It's not unusual like in a uh, vCloud Foundation environment, right? Um, because at that point you're handing off hopefully in a, a, a range of IP addresses that really you're going to let that team dole out and swizzle however that they want to. And you're worried more about that layer three handoff and, and they can operate really in a, in a cloud-like fashion. So you're not having to worry about all the networking of NSX. Anything additional on that one, Matt? I would just re-emphasize the fact that you know it's important regardless of what path the customer goes down that the network team and the server teams they need to start communicating with each other and if you start talking about bringing both nsx and aci together i would list it as a, a critical component if they have like a hard silo between them or if they don't have a good relationship there's politics going on to whatever to where they just do not get along for whatever reason in my opinion, it's going to be doomed to failure because yeah. you need mutual cooperation. Do you, and so I, I assume then we're still seeing that in the customer base these days. Are you seeing uh, examples of where those subdivisions are still persevering um, and those differences are still something that has to be addressed? I guess you wouldn't bring it up if it wasn't still a reality. Um, um, there's well, a reality to it here and there. There is. Um, I've seen both sides of it. Obviously, you know, Eric and I, we, we split the customer opportunities. You know, it just depends on how, uh, what person it goes to. But um, I've been encouraged by a few organizations that I've spoken to and that they have begun developing uh, what they tend to call a tiger team. So it's not necessarily a, a network team or a server team or a storage team. It's one team, but they've got representation from network, from security, maybe even from the application side, yeah. all working together very cohesively. And I, I'm sure to tell those customers like that is very forward thinking and that is the way forward because that's going to remove any of those real or perceived roadblocks to making these solutions work well together. 
how does we when we were talking earlier you i can't remember which one you brought this up i I think it was eric but you were talking about uh, the ways in which nsx and don't mean this in a negative way but network oriented folks may need to be on the lookout for ways in which nsx may sneak into an organization um assuming i'm characterizing that correctly can you restate it correctly and expand on it sure Sure. You know, so a, a good example is you might have an environment that uh, a customer has ACI in place today and all of a sudden Pivotal Container System comes into the fold, right? That's going to be running NSX. Now the question is, how do we integrate this? And, and that's why it, it's always important when we do an ACI design workshop that we have that discussion of what if and how do we plan for that what if that a sidecar like environment like this comes in where it's really not a, it, it it's an environment that's going to connect to the ACI fabric and how are we going to accommodate for that and it, it works well you just have to know how to plan for it and operationalize that right who's going to own that peering uh who's how far can that network team own NSX, so how far are they willing to, right? And if there's pushback on that, right, getting that Tiger Team mentality that Matt referred to in place to avoid the layer eight and nine issues. Okay. Is there any way that you would see that happening? Is there anything that gets triggered? Is there any failure scenario that you need to be aware of? Or is it just something that kind of comes up and it would come up in conversation and thus you need to then dig in further? Just trying to think of it as a major, you know, sometimes you get something on the network suddenly that's just handing out addresses or something, and uh, it becomes obvious um, that something bad is happening. But I don't think you're talking about that type of intrusion on no. the network. No, yeah. you, usually it's the, oh, by the way, in the next six months, we're putting in PKS. <laughs> okay. Right. And the network team goes, and how are we doing that? Right. And, and, or and what's again, PKS? <laughs> yeah. yeah, what is it, right? But no doubt. But it, it, it's, you know, having those discussions when we do these design workshops or these briefings, giving people, you know, a little forward thinking about how do we address this if it needs to happen? And don't yeah. be scared about it. There's nothing technical that says you cannot and will not integrate these two environments. It's educating them on how it can be done, the different options, because there's multiple ways to do NSX on ACI. It's just a matter of what's the right way for what we're putting in. And it's not one way or the other. Both ways can integrate at the same time. So it's just getting people to step back and not worry about, you know, is is it even going to work? It's how do we make it work? How do we deliver what the business needs? Talk a little bit about, um, I don't think we've kind of gotten into this, but single overlay versus double overlay. Um, whoever wants to take that. What's, how, how does, it seems like that that's the potential also that you get into. And, and I remember back from my Cisco experience, it felt like VMware was, is always willing to say, we don't care what's underneath. Um, in reality, I think, we all do, um, and so it's not something you're going to leave to chance. But is there is there an issue with with single or double overlays and a choice to be made there in terms of when you're when you're looking at these deployments? It's definitely something you have to consider, especially when you know you always want to just understand how the technology is working underneath. Um, yeah. You're absolutely right, and with an NSX only design, VMware being software only, they have the luxury of saying, "Oh, we don't care about." what the, uh, the physical network infrastructure looks like. In reality, that's, that's not quite true. You know, it does not absolve you from good network design, but when you bring ACI and NSX together, you've got a really strong, resilient and robust underlay right there waiting for you. Now, as far as single overlay or double overlay is concerned, ACI is both an underlay and an overlay solution. That's the way it's always going to work. You cannot choose to just not use the overlay if you don't want. So it's always going to be there. But with NSX, it's not exactly the same thing. So you can deploy NSX in a couple of different ways, but you have the option of whether or not you want to use the software overlay capabilities. 
And so that's where this whole single underlay or single overlay, excuse me, versus double overlay debate comes into play is the real question is, you know, are we going to use the overlay capabilities of NSX or not? And so if you're not, you just have to make some considerations for how that's going to be deployed on the, uh, the ACI side. You're also going to be foregoing certain features and capabilities that NSX has because there are uh, some capabilities within NSX that relies on that overlay capability. Here's one I just thought of that I don't think we talked about in advance as we were planning in this conversation. So I'm just curious, take this away. What is it, you know, you always worry about the old, um, I always have this thing on my walls, it's not the network's fault, um, you know, but this notion of, of uh, when it comes to troubleshooting and, and something like this, if you're in a dual environment like this, how high is the chance that it's more difficult to discern exactly where your issues are coming from? And, and does your vendor support suddenly get different because they feel like that's, well, you didn't deploy NSX in the way in which we recommend and you're doing it in this situation. Is, is there any finger pointing issues or something to worry about there in your, uh, you know, in your day two beyond scenarios? Uh, thankfully that doesn't seem to be a problem, at least not one that I've heard of. Both VMware and Cisco have come to the realization that customers are going to do this and <laughs> with or without their Both help. And that's really a, uh, a great position for a, a corporation like Worldwide to be in because we sit in the middle and we're able to explain the facts to yeah. the customer of how exactly they need to do it and what they need to look out for. But uh, both VMware and Cisco have design guides for bringing the two solutions together. That doesn't mean they necessarily see eye to eye, but um, to my knowledge, there hasn't been any like supportability issues or anything like that. To ACI, the encapsulated packets is just another service writing on top of the, yeah. the fabric, so it shouldn't really interfere. Yeah, so, some of that will come down to, you know, single overlay versus double overlay. Where do you start looking then, right? And, and usually right. if it's a single overlay, people start looking in ACI in its tool set versus NSX, where when double overlay, they'll start looking in the NSX tool set. Okay, let me ask you about this. Another potentially, I don't want to say a dangerous question. I'm going to talk a learning curve. So I know going from traditional data center understanding of how things work, to ACI was kind of a big turn for me, and I've never had to deploy it. Um, so I can't imagine what someone going through that from a deployment perspective is looking at. So I know there's a learning curve, you know, and a different headspace to be in with terminology and kind of equating things on the Cisco ACI side. My assumption is, is that the same, is there some similar thing on the VMware side? Or if I'm a vSphere expert and I've worked in this for years, am I going to get NSX like that or... What's the what's the what's the uh, learning curve to be aware of in, in in either of these? Both sides have learning curves. There's okay. there's simply no way around it. ACI's got its nuances and NSX has it uh, its own set of nuances. How NSX routes between different layers, tier zero and tier one, is very different than what a traditional uh, Cisco networking person is used to. Right, so regardless of which technology or both you're going to you're going to have new skills and and learning those skills is going to be incredibly important and then on top of that they both do automation so you're going to be getting new skills there anyhow because if you're sitting in the cli or the gui all the time you're probably not spending the time best there right versus learning some of the good basics of automation yeah, does either direction that you choose to go in, do you feel like either side has any limitations in terms of where people are going next, whether it be cloud adoption, uh, but automation and DevOps tool sets, uh, anything like that? Does Are they both kind of working in that direction and seem none of these decisions are necessarily going to affect that negatively or anything to be aware of there? I mean, Cisco has definitely done an outstanding job of embracing the idea of automation and orchestration. Most people are probably familiar with Cisco DevNet. There's a, an enormous community there and an entire line of uh, professional certification. So um, both, both Cisco and VMware, as far as like ACI and NSX are concerned, both have a very robust and well-documented API 
So you'd be able to interact with that API directly if you'd like, or consume a tool like Ansible or Terraform, things like that. You're going yeah, to be it feels like prepared. when we get into the Ansible, Terraform, and, and especially APIs, now we're starting to get a language that's potentially working across more than even just Cisco and VMware. And so maybe that goes to your, your point of saying, if you're spending too much time in the UI of any one of those things, then you're probably not doing your job correctly because you need to, because a lot of that stuff is happening at that level is going to be more of the grunt work that you really want automation to take over, I would assume. And that's generally the goal of moving to STN, right? Is to make things easier and get to a point where we're doing less of the mistake prone manual intervention. Oh, a- absolutely. Because, you know, it, when, when you're deploying VMs, you're going to be doing API calls to vCenter. You're going to be doing API calls to NSX or ACI, right? You're going to be hitting multiple environments from, let's say, a, an Ansible playbook or, or something like that, right? Or or uh, within Terraform, you're going to be hitting multiple environments anyhow. So, Interesting. All right. Well, guys, as we wrap up here, um, I'll tell you what. Tell me a little bit about what resources you might have available because this is, I know you guys are always good at this and you've already been hammering on me that education never stops. And a lot of this sounds like, um, it sounds like anyone watching this, if this is truly a question, someone in our audience has a mind, you know, trying to figure out which direction to go. I think the only real way you could probably help them, I would assume is know something a little bit more about their architecture. And it feels like it's a more personal interactive discussion. Um, what kind of things have you guys um, started doing or have you been doing, I should say, at Worldwide to, um, uh, to offer more assistance in this area? Yeah, so at Worldwide, we're very proud of our uh, what we call our platform, the WWT platform. You can go out to WWT.com to check it out. But we have a variety of resources uh, di- divided up by a solution area there. And so the area that Eric and I obviously focus on is data center networking. So we have a a variety of workshops that we could give for a customer and also uh, both schedulable and on-demand labs. So uh, lots of different resources to get a customer up and running there. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. Yeah. uh, You know, in this particular area, we have briefings that are available that talk about ACI and NSX, NSX on ACI, uh, really just talking about the technology, digging into what you're trying to do. And then we have workshops that can be anywhere from four, four hours to maybe a a day, two days, depending on size and complexity on those same topics and really getting into being design workshops around those three topics, right? One, you know, ACI, NSX, or both. And then I assume that's where, and those are, and that indeed, when you talk about getting into design workshops, this is where you're going to get into let me understand a little bit about, you mentioned uh, at the top and throughout, what are you trying to accomplish? Um, Cause so it's not enough for them to say, I want to do SDN, whatever that means. <laughs> you want to know uh, both where they want to go long-term, a little bit more about the organization if you don't already understand them, cause you guys have a lot of good relationships. And then also I would assume kind of uh, where they are in terms of uh, what's been deployed, what's been attempted perhaps um, and, and things of that nature to account for the recommendations that would then follow from there. Um, so I assume, cause this is not a decision. No one cuts over to this kind of thing overnight. This is something that requires kind of a strategic, um, rollout or extension as you slowly retire old ways of doing things, adopt new ways, or perhaps bring up new sites, uh, and such as you do this, I would assume. A- absolutely. We, m- everyone kind of chuckles at my mantra is SDN is not a project. It's a journey. Okay. It's a crawl, walk, run type of engagement, right? It, there, you're always bringing in new apps. It doesn't stop. Yeah. It's funny how fast can, can we still kind of remember the point where we were arguing about whether SDN in terms of granted every vendor, and I'm guilty of this is overhyped the latest hot acronym. Um, but obviously the, the fundamentals of what we mean, you know, when we're talking about centralized control um, in these type of situations, that's obviously taken root. I don't think there's any question about that being the way to go long term uh, in terms of efficient scaling and efficient operations. Um, so I assume there's no argument to be made there. And I think that's fine. Let's move on forward. So it sounds like this question still gets resolved. We got either or or both. Um, and it sounds like the best way to address this, obviously, is to engage with you guys. And then as much as I enjoy visiting you in St. Louis, um, either of which 
or you guys in St. Louis, uh, but you both travel a lot, or at least you used to. Um, and But this is all stuff that can be online as well, so someone doesn't necessarily have to come out there. It doesn't matter where they're located in the world. Uh, this is still something that you guys could provide assistance and support for, correct? Correct. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. Excellent. Well, guys, thank you so much. I appreciate you weighing in. I do hope we get to get on planes again and get back in front of customers physically, face-to-face as soon as possible. But let's all stay safe until then. Thank you to our audience. Appreciate you watching. My name is Rob Boyd. Thank you so much. We'll see you on the next one.